<clears throat> well, thanks. Thank you a lot. And uh, it's obviously a pleasure to give this talk. And uh, it's nice to uh, be able to reach such a broad and varied audience. And uh, yeah, so this talk will be about deep learning in imaging and microscopy. And of course, this has plenty of applications in biology and bi biological physics. So uh, first of all, I would like to start with a very quick overview of where quantitative microscopy uh, played a role over the history of science, if you wish. So if we go back 100 years, we can, uh, well, I guess many of you can recognize this picture. This is a picture of the manual tracking of uh, particles in a liquid that Perrin did in the early 1900. And by doing this, so this tracking was really done by projecting an image from a microscope with micro particles that were diffusing on a screen and tracking them manually. And by doing this, Perrin was able actually to demonstrate that there is brownian motion, measure the diffusion, and therefore demonstrate the experimentally the existence of atoms. So it's always striking to think that 100 years ago, people were not sure whether atoms existed or were just uh, a nice and clever mathematical construction. But this demonstratively, Perrin got the Nobel Prize for that. And then, of course, microscopy kept on growing. And in the 50s, people start hybridizing microscopy with electronics. The first case of an hybridization of a microscopy electronics comes from coal mining. And there, the problem is that you want to detect if there are coal particles in the air. And this was uh, the first mention of having an automatic device that could image these particles and warn the miners. But of course, then the big success of microscopy with the electronic came with the biology, especially cell counters and uh, similar devices. And in the 90s, with the development of digital video microscopy, originally by Crocker and Greer, and then by many others that followed up, where by measuring the brownian motion of colloidal particles, we can infer a lot of properties about microscopic systems. And the most recent uh, revolution in this field has been in the last uh, decade, or less actually, the introduction of deep learning. And here you see an example of a UNET, where, which was a very groundbreaking way of segmenting pictures. And also we entered this field a few years ago, providing a new software, which uh, is called DeepTrack to do a lot of these tasks of uh, microscopy with uh, deep learning. So this gives you an overview and where things fit. So really now the, we are at the time in which microscopy and deep learning are coming together. And the overview of this talk will be the following. First, I will give an example worked out to giving you more or less all the details of the steps we followed in developing a solution for a real problem we had. And, and then I will uh, very briefly mention some other applications and introduce very, very briefly DeepTrack, which is a free software for doing microscopy with Python. Well, machine learning enhanced microscopy with Python. Okay, so let's start with a worked out example. And here we go back to the problem of, well, of particle tracking or even particle localization more correctly. And here the problem is uh, if you acquire a video with many particles in it and you want to well, measure the properties of these particles, like doing digitally what Perrin did manually, you will need to first of all identify the position of these particles. And this is done routinely by hundreds and thousands of labs around the world by thresholding this image essentially. So where you take a thresholded version of this image and then you have these white blobs on a black, black background. And if you measure the centroid of these blobs, you end up uh, having a measure of the position of the particles, which actually and surprisingly is actually subpixel. So you achieve subpixel position with this technique. And then if you connect this traces over time, you can get information about how the particles move and, for example, repeat to the experiment of the RAN. What's the problem with this technique? Well, it works very well when the imaging is very good. And, but a few years ago, we had to deal with this kind of images or videos. And here, just to give you a background, this has, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a video where there are bacteria, these fluorescent particles, bright fluorescent particles, moving on a background of uh, silica colloidal particles, four micron in diameter, these uh, roundish shapes that you see on the background. But you see that this video is extremely difficult to track because 
yes, all the problems you can imagine essentially in digital video microscopy. And just to give an idea how difficult it is to track, if we tried, when we try to track it with the standard methods, the best, the very best we could do is this. And you see, this is not good. And what is worse is that this works only on this patch of this video. This will not work at all on other patches of the same video and let alone other videos. So that's the point. It was around 2018 when we decided to give a shot at uh, deep learning because it was uh, so successful with image manipulation that it might be worth trying with digital microscopy. So that's what we did. We decided to use a convolutional neural network, which is the standard workhorse for uh, managing images in deep learning. And the idea was that we could input an image of a particle and get at the output, the position of the particle. What's the problem with this approach? Obviously, you need to be able to train this neural network, as I guess all of you know. And to train the neural network, you need a lot, millions of images of the particle with known ground truth. Oh, now, the problem with that is obviously that if you know the position of the particle in your image, then you don't really have a problem to solve because it means that you already can track the particle. So what did we do? Well, what we decided to do was to use simulated images. So we basically simulated a lot of images of particles. The advantage being that we knew the ground truth, the position of the particles, and we also knew we could generate as many as we wanted, essentially. And by training the neural network on these images, we could get something that worked extremely well. Now, the next problem is that it will work very well on the simulated images. Will it work on experimental images? Well, that's what we tried next. So what we did was to trap a particle. So this is a particle held in an optical twister, and we are imaging with the standard microscope, bright field, a bit the focus because actually this is the best condition to track the part this particle with the, the standard the threshold method and we get some traces so you see that the standard method tracks this particle perfectly the track does equally perfectly the two traces agree down to a fraction of a pixel which is not too surprising but uh, then we can actually, which basically tells us that uh, we can do with neural network, we can already do with standard methods, which is nice, but not in per se very interesting. But before going further, we can also quantify the properties of this trajectory. In particular, since it's just an optically trapped particle, we expect the probability distribution to be Gaussian. And in fact, when we measure the probability distribution, we get a very nice Gaussian, which agrees with the theory which is the dashed line, the dashed black line. And we can also measure the autocorrelation function, which is an inverted exponential, again, agreeing very well with the theory, which is again represented by the dashed line. Now, okay, so it works everything fine with the perfect image of the particle. What is the next step? The next step was basically to switch off the very high quality LED illumination in the microscope and place an incandescence lamp next to the setup. And then this very same particle in the very same optical twister looks like this. And you see that this is a nightmare to track. And in fact, the standard method doesn't work at all, while the neural network works pretty well. It looks good. So it looks really sticking, finding the center of this particle in this video. And we can then look at the trajectory. The standard method produces something that is clearly wrong. And the neural network produces something that might be plausible. Of course, we don't know the ground truth. It doesn't need, it will never be identical to the previous trajectory because obviously this is a random process. And that's where it's nice to compare the probability distribution. So since this is the same particle in the same optical trap, the probability distribution must be the same as before. And when we look at the standard methods, we get that the probability distribution is completely wrong. While with deep track, we get the right probability distribution. Even more interestingly, we find that uh, the uh, autocorrelation function, well, the standard method gets something that is essentially delta correlated. And anyone who has ever taken any course in signal processing knows that a delta correlated signal is just white noise. This means that the standard method gives us white noise. And there is no information content that we can use, basically. Of course, there are these small peaks, and I guess you can already guess what is the frequency. 
The frequency of these peaks is 100 Hz, so it's every 10 milliseconds. The reason for these peaks is basically because we are in Europe and we have a 50 Hz power grid, and this is the intensity of the incandescent lamp. So, you know, that's everything we can get out of this machine. But notice very well that when we use the deep track trace, we get a very nice inverse, inverse, uh, inverted exponential, which is in agreement with the previous one. And also we don't get, it's able to basically eliminate all the influence of the incandescent lamp. So now we don't see the peaks at all superimposed to this inverted exponential. So we have a very nice result, which was very convincing for us. And then we apply this technique to the original video. You see that now it works perfectly, the tracking of the particles. And it works on all the video, not only on this patch and all the videos we had. And even more, now we can even track the particles and the bacteria independently from each other, distinguishing them. So we were very happy with this. And then it's uh, when we decided to try to apply this technique to a very broad range of applications, and now we go exactly to look at this application, which will be a much faster, uh, more a taste of different ways in which we can use deep learning. And uh, without going to all details. So let's start with a very simple application. Well, not very simple, but with the first application in which essentially we want to characterize nanoparticles flowing in a microfluidic channel. So we have this nanoparticle flowing in a microfluidic channel, and uh, we image them with holograph with holography. And from the hologram of these particles, we want to reconstruct their size and refractive index. This is a very difficult problem, especially if you want to do it with very few frames, which you do want because you want to keep the flow as fast as possible so that you can get more statistics. And I'm not going to go into much details of this, but you can see that the deep learning converges towards the an accurate result with very, very few frames. You see how well picked is uh, the deep learning with a monodispersed distribution of particles, while the standard methods will produce a very, very broad spread of sizes of particles. What is the trick here? The trick here is that you need to use simulations to train the neural network that are physically accurate, which means that you need to simulate correctly the miscattering on the spheres, as well as the all the idiosyncrasies of the setups, including all aberrations and so on, because you want to get not just the position of the particle, which is a kind of quality, semi-qualitative parameter, but really the physical properties of the particle. As a next example, one thing that I said before is that to train a neural network, you need millions of images. And that's true in general, but we managed very recently to do something very interesting, which is to, we managed to train a neural network using a single image. So we go from million to a single crop. You take a crop of your particle and without knowing where is the particle in the crop, so without ground truth. And here you see a simulated example. So here we see that we can track the particle. Even though we train this neural network with a single crop with one particle, and we didn't know where, is the, where was the particle in that crop when we were training, and uh, notice that the level of noise changes during the video, you still can track it. And this can be done on many, many different kinds of particles. So you can uh, really train the neural network to train to track the particle you want. And of course, these are all simulated particles, which is nice because, for example, it permits us to uh, establish uh, how this compare with the kramer rao limit. And it compares very well because we reach it. So this means that theoretically you cannot really do better than this information theoretically, but uh, doesn't really apply on real video. So if you want to go to real video, we took these videos from the self tracking challenge. And here you see that the neural network learns also in this case to track the cells. Here you will see now the heat map that the neural network constructs to track the cells. And you see that this tracks the cells extremely well. And this is very interesting because the neural network learns this from a single crop of a cell where we don't know where is the cell. The neural network also doesn't know anything about the fact that there are multiple cells when it's trained, but still learns to track all these cells. And this can be done on different kinds of cells, like these ones, which even change shape over time, or this one, which are, again, morphologically quite different, or even plankton, where depending on the size of the crop, you can track essentially the mouth of the plankton or the whole organism. 
So just to give you a flavor for how, why this works, this works essentially because we exploit symmetries, what is called geometric deep learning. And in practice, this means that if you have, a, well, essentially the idea is the following. If I give you a single crop of a particle and I tell you just that there is a particle, you don't know where is the particle. What you know though, is that if you translate a crop by a certain amount, the position of the particle is translated by the same amount. That's known. Now we can apply the neural network to two crops that are slightly translated. And then we want at the output of the neural network to resource that are translated by an equal amount. Any deviation from that will give us an error signal, which we can exploit to train the neural network. And that's what we do this on a larger scale using not only translation, but also rotations and other things. So going down for millions of images for which we need ground truth, the single crop without ground truth. Another example of a recent work we did was to extend the idea of a particle tracing over time using, again, geometric deep learning, but in this, sense, in this case using graph neural networks, which uh, by the way, maybe some of you know because they are the ones that Google, for example, uses for, uh, uh, for reconstructing the structure of the proteins. So it's the same kind of uh, neural network architecture. Uh, but essentially here, what we do is to reconstruct the trajectory from the detections. The advantage of using graph neural network instead of the standard algorithm, such as the Hungarian algorithm and so on, is that we can do a lot of things that would be impossible otherwise. For example, we can tell properties of a system of particles, even when we cannot reconstruct the trajectories. For example, because the particles are too dense, or because they blink, we can still, for example, tell what is the diffusivity of the particles, even though we are not able to reconstruct the individual trajectories. And this is because it looks at the system as a graph and not as a set, a set of particles. Again, I'm not going to go too much details. If you're interested, I'm very happy to discuss them more in depth. Another example that is a bit more concrete is to study the mic microplankton. So, so one important thing is that microplankton is extremely important in ecosystems. Most of the oxygen we breathe, well, half of the oxygens we breathe comes from microplanktons. But we understand very, very little about them. In particular, we don't really know much about how they behave and which plankton eats, eats with which other plankton. It's very difficult to see, to follow at the single cellular cell level what plankton does. Here, what we developed was a device, which is essentially a microscope, a holographic microscope that permits us to observe in real time and for the whole duration of the experiment and the life of the microplankton, the whole sample so that microplankton cannot escape. We see it for the whole life cycle from when they are born until they die. And we can then quantify everything we want, for example, how much they eat. And we don't not only measure their 3D position, we can also measure their mass. So we know, for example, if a plankton eats another plankton, how much it grows, how much fatter it gets. So here you see, for example, a predator, which is this yellow plankton and a prey, which is this blue plankton. And you will see that the yellow plankton goes around and at some point finds the prey and eats it. I mean, this is one of the first time that you can see an actual uh, prey predator event resolved to this degree. And uh, I can also tell you that we can actually measure the increase in mass in the predator and it's the full prey, which of course is something that you would not be able to do otherwise. And of course, we can also measure, for example, when there are division events and measure what is the ratio of mass that goes into the daughter, mother cells and so on. So this is a very interesting de development. And okay, so another example, also a very recent one, it's uh, about measuring single molecules. So what we did here was to study our single molecule. Uh, well, we want to essentially measure single molecules. We want to measure their mass and we want to measure the optical scattering and their diffusivity. And this can be done by placing them in a very, very small channel, a nano channel, and measuring essentially the shadow they produce. Here you will see the shadow, this is shadow of a molecule. This is a shadow of a relatively large molecule. If I remember correctly, it's in the order of uh, 500 kilodalton, if I remember correctly. So it's very easy to track with standard methods. 
But if we go down to a few kilo less, in this paper we went down to 50 kilodalton, then it becomes not so obvious where is the particle. But this can be still measured if you use deep learning to clean and to analyze your images. With very, very recent uh, experiments, which are not published yet, we could even go down even lower than that limit, basically at the limit of, dete of detection and uh, characterization of uh, any other method. Keep in mind that this molecule is completely freely diffusing the channel, so we don't need to label it or to fix it to a surface to measure it. So in that sense, it's a label-free uh, measurement. Okay, as uh, one more example, it's the virtual staining. This is actually very popular, I would say, in California, because there are all the various, various groups working on it, in particular, the group of Ido and Oscan in UCLA. But anyway, also, we also gave a small contribution in this field by uh, doing virtual staining of bright field images. So here you see a bright field image of, um, this is an image of uh, fat cells, essentially, which contain uh, these fat bubbles. And we want to measure essentially three components, the fat uh, lip, the, yeah, mm, essentially fat droplets, this green channel, then the cytoplasm, which is this red channel, and the nuclei, which is this uh, blue channel. And this is a chemical staining of these cells. By training a neural network, and this is a GAN, so a generative adversarial network, you can uh, essentially get the same information, but without having to chemically stain, which of course is very convenient if you want to, for example, not kill your cells and fixate them, or if you want to observe them in real time, or if you just want to do it faster without having to wait for the chemical staining to take place. Okay. So about this, four, it, four minutes left. Okay. That's perfectly fine. So, uh, yeah, I just gave you a very, very quick overview of uh, various applications we have developed in the last uh, few years uh, using deep learning for microscopy. So we, a lot of these applications require very advanced techniques that require new code. And uh, at some point we decided that uh, we needed to have uh, our own, uh, some code that we could uh, used to for prototyping and developing this application in a more efficient way. So this deep track came up and now it's at the version, uh, well, then we had to rewrite it a couple of years ago completely. That's why it's called deep track two. And now deep track two is at the version 1.5.4 actually, or five, 1.5.5 in reality. Uh, this is a completely open software in Python. It's a package in Python, completely open and free to use. It's MIT licensed, so you can really use it in the most free way. And uh, it's available on, as I said, on GitHub, on uh, softmatterlab slash deeptrack2. And uh, yeah, it's fully documented. You have Jupyter notebooks. You have all the information you need to actually use it effectively in your research. And uh, if you are very interested in deep learning with microscopy, we very recently uh, uh, produce this roadmap together with a lot of the leading groups around the world in the field. And as you know, like in all the ro this roadmap, you have a contribution, many contribution, in this case it's 36 contribution of a few pages on each topic. So you can actually select and pick and select whatever you like and you're in most interested in and see a bit what the, some of the uh, leaders in the field think about it right now. And uh, finally, if you are very, very interested in these kind of topics, we organize a yearly conference in San Diego, so close to Fullerton, I guess. And uh, that takes place every year in the context of the SPE for optics and photonics. And we organize together with uh, Joana Pereira in Karolinska Institute, Daniel Brunner in uh, Femto NC in France, and Ido uh, Oscan in UCLA. And uh, we are now at the fourth or fifth uh, four times that we organized it this year. And it's a very nice and lively environment in case some of you wants to join. And with that, I would like to thank you. And hopefully I gave you an inter, I hopefully I convinced you that it's a good idea to combine digital microscopy with deep learning. I tried to do that through a worked out example, just a very quick overview of applications and some uh, overview to this tool that uh, you can use if you're thinking about that, which is deep track. That thing. I would like to thank you. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. 
Thank you very much, Shivani. We can all give our Zoom applause. Um, and there's a, there's a few questions in the in the chat coming up. Um, <clears throat> first question is: Did you try tracking in a bioreferent environment? In a bioreferent environment, uh, you mean like liquid crystals? I guess uh, we didn't try, but I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work. Okay. Um, another question, um, partially related to the, well, related to the particle type, um, you focus on center of mass tracking. What about orientation of non-spherical objects? Can your algorithms track these too? Yes, yes, you can. I mean, just to maybe clarify a bit to what is the, a big part of the algorithm is really to provide the tools to simulate your training set. And we did use it to simulate non-spherical particles and objects that are, uh, very far from spherical and also to measure their orientation. Okay, there's a more general question. Um, I work in computer vision for more mundane applications. How do you measure the accuracy of your algorithms and what sort of metrics do you collect? It really depends on the case, on a case by case. Something that maybe I, yeah. First of all, all of our work, we always compare with some ground no ground truth, but also with some, uh, let's say, uh, baseline method that is no machine learning, just to be sure that we can actually, on some metrics, improve over that. Then, which metrics specifically we consider case by case depends on the case, obviously. But uh, yeah, it, I would have to answer basically for each case, and I guess that will take a lot of time. Um, so this is a related question, I think, um, is how widely does your synthetic data generalize? Do you need to regenerate the data for a different camera, different particle type, et cetera? It really depends on what you want to do, because if you want something like a characterization of physical properties of a system, then you need to do it for the specific acquisition system. Uh, but um, if you just want the position of a particle, then uh, you almost, it's very, very easy to do you don't really probably need to do that because then uh, it doesn't really matter. Plus, you always have a trade-off between how general you want your training set to be and how precise you are going to uh, accurate and precise you're going to get the results because if you use a more uh, um, select a set of parameters for your training, then the network uh, learns to make some assumptions that it doesn't if you have a very broad uh, set of training data. So it's always a trade-off. So it's really on the user to decide what they need and what they want. Um, okay, I have a question asked too. You mentioned about the um, diffusion from particles where you were not actually tracking the trajectories or the positions. Um, and mm -hmm. this was in the graph network application. Can you say a little bit more about how you get the diffusion from that? Well, essentially the graph neural networks does uh, uh, what it does is to do something similar to what Google does with the search engine, at least with the uh, original page rank uh, algorithm, where it looks at. So basically, what you do is to connect everything with everything and see, and uh, you have uh, something that propagates, that crawls this graph and learns properties about this graph. Then you don't really know what connects to what, as long as uh, you train it to recognize what's going on. And this, for example, if you have a very dense packing of particles so that between two frames, you don't know which one is which because maybe your frame rate is not fast enough. Well, it doesn't matter because you still can learn how to recognize the diffusion. And we show that in the paper. That's okay, it. got it. Yeah, that clarifies, thank you. Um, I think this is, we have time for one last question. Um, are there ever problems with hallucinations? These sometimes occur in uh, DL applications. Uh, Yes, especially when you use adversarial approaches, and that's obviously something that you have to take into account. Uh, a lot of our, uh, the, apart from the virtual standing, everything that I showed uh, it doesn't really use adversarial approaches, so it's less likely to hallucinate. But of course, uh, you have to be careful about what you do, and you have to be careful that, for example, you don't use a train network outside the training range. But let's say in deployment of applications in real environments, there are ways to check for that. And it should be implemented, but it's always a problem. That. <laughs>